This video has been brought to you by Squarespace. More on that later. Magic has become an irreplaceable part of fantasy fiction. I mean, according to Wikipedia, magical elements are one of the genre's most important factors. And you can find lectures, essays, and YouTube videos picking apart magic systems in fiction, saying what makes a good one versus a bad one, saying whether a hard magic or soft magic is better. But something that I find fascinating is that this is a relatively contemporary fixation. Much of the fiction that we now consider foundational to the genre today is far less concerned with what makes a good magic system, and more so, what magic is. The Lord of the Rings, for all that it shaped modern fantasy as we see it today, is no different. Its magic system, if you could even call it that, is vague and arbitrary. It's kind of more of a deus ex machina to get characters out of any binds that they can't get out of with natural means. It's the kind of thing that Brandon Sanderson fans would probably scoff at as bad magic writing if it came out this year. But despite these criticisms, the magic of The Lord of the Rings has its own complex internal logic rooted deeply in Tolkien's understanding of the function of magic, religion, and science throughout the ages. Today, we're going to take a look at these factors and see how they formed the creative magic that lies at the very heart of Middle-earth. The idea of magic, and what it was, and what it represented, was far from a simple question for Tolkien. He was devoutly Catholic, a religion which certainly frowns upon magic and sorcery, but he was also a medievalist, and medieval literature is riddled with unexplainable supernatural events. Tolkien was also writing in the early to mid 20th century, a time when science was advancing in leaps and bounds, and an increasingly rationalized world was making the concept of magic more and more obsolete by the year. Thus, trying to make a world, even a fantasy world, that would reflect the innocent medieval vision of a world infused with fairy would be quite the task. For Tolkien and his friends then, it seems that the matter of magic in their writing was a topic of frequent conversation, in particular with his friend C.S. Lewis, who you might be familiar with. In an essay on the functions of magic in the writing of Tolkien and his contemporaries, Tom Shippey examines a piece by C.S. Lewis titled, English Literature in the 16th Century, Excluding Drama. While it may have been a bit of a dry topic, this volume of the Oxford History of English Literature covers a fascinating topic. The function of magic in literature in a new age of enlightenment. Lewis proposes that a significant shift occurred in the 16th century as the Renaissance, a rebirth of art, music, literature, and science swept across Europe. In this period of social upheaval, the outdated medieval worldview was cast aside in favor for new, more rational perceptions of the world. In reality, they weren't quite as rational as they thought they were, and a lot of their teachings are now today considered pretty musty. For example, many of them still believed in the existence of magic. You see, for 16th century thinkers, a belief in science did not preclude a belief in magic. Rather than looking at this as the medieval magician versus the renaissance scientist, we should be looking at this as the medieval magician versus the renaissance astrologist. Shippey describes these opposing options, the astrologer stern, deterministic, the magician optimistic, empirical, a rejecter of Aristotle and the schoolmen of the Middle Ages. Rather than doing away with the belief in the supernatural entirely, scholars of the day sought to change magic to better fit their worldview, blending science and magic together as they sought to understand the natural world. Suddenly, magic, with the power of science, could be used, it could be wielded. Magic was covert and hidden, a secret occult art that could be studied and learned in order to have unnatural power over nature. This form of magic is referred to by Lewis as Goetia, I think that's how that's pronounced, I really hope that's how that's pronounced, which roughly translates to sorcery in Greek. This is at odds with the medieval perception of magic, which was as a force far beyond human control. There were a few wizards, like Merlin of King Arthur's court, who managed to harness some of this power, but they never truly mastered or dominated it in the way that Renaissance scholars viewed it. This is especially true in medieval literature. Tales like Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, in which a giant 
giant green man has his head chopped off and then picks up his head and the head continues talking, blend unreality and reality together, telling this tale of the forces of man against untouchable fey nature. Lewis refers to this softer, less controllable type of magic as magia. This sort of uncontrollable magical energy seems less tangible, less acceptable, as scholars began being able to sort reality into little boxes. There was philosophy, there was physics, there was astronomy. Nature no longer had to be an unknown and uncontrollable magia was taken over by man-made, man-dominated Goetia. Lewis wrote, The medieval author seems to write for a public to whom magic, like knight errantry, is part of the furniture of romance. The Elizabethan for a public who feel that it might be going on in the next street. The concept of magic as Goetia, as something to be controlled and mastered, seems to have persisted into the modern era, blending in some rather unflattering ways with advances in science. In The Golden Bough, the author J.G. Fraser presents us with a theory about the interaction of religion, science, and magic in the modern era. This diagram, summarizing this idea, was originally created by Tom Shippey, but I I put it into bright colors because apparently I can't understand complicated ideas unless they are laid out before me with bright colors. The point of this diagram is to show where these concepts agree, and he believes that any two of these points, when joined together by their shared attribute, kind of cancel out the third point of the triangle. Accepting both religion and magic requires an acceptance of the supernatural, something that seems to clash with many of the tenets of modern science. Religion and science are both contemporarily accepted ideas, and it makes magic seem antiquated, outdated, and no longer necessary for the modern era. Both magic, at least Goetian Renaissance style magic, and science have a coercive element. Element. They are mankind trying to define the world around them with rules, trying to coerce it and control it in a way. This is at odds with religion, where one must learn to accept that there are higher powers at work and mankind cannot control everything. Although Lewis and his contemporaries never fully like signed off on this admittedly limited look at very lofty and complicated concepts, it did do a good job of expressing one particular fear that they had. The Inklings feared that the science magic side of the triangle was coming to overwhelm religion. Science was promising more and more as it advanced, offering what seemed like limitless power to human beings. Things. Science was becoming the new Goetia. This is hardly a new fear. It was clearly expressed in 1818 in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. In the novel, the young Victor Frankenstein grows up on the pseudoscientific teachings of Renaissance scholars. Frankenstein is set alight by their promises of power, control, and omniscience and is understandably quite upset when he enters university and finds out that none of these promises are scientifically founded. His professor explains to him that although Renaissance scientists were not able to back up their vows, modern science was making all this and more possible. The ancient teachers of this science promised impossibilities and performed nothing. The modern master, whose hands seem only made to dabble in dirt and their eyes to pour over the microscope or crucible, have indeed performed miracles. They penetrate into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. They ascend into the heavens. They have acquired new and almost unlimited powers. They can command the thunders of heaven, mimic the earthquake, and even mock the invisible world with its own shadows. If you know anything about young Victor Frankenstein, you will know that his attempts at godlike power leave him closer to hell than heaven. And if you don't know that tale, you can check out the over an hour long video I did about Frankenstein for this Halloween. I will link it here and in the description, and you should, uh, Watch that after you watch this one. However, this blending of science and Goetia, of using unnatural powers in order to advance yourself, was not the be-all and end-all of magic, as Tolkien and C.S. Lewis saw it. They believed that Goetia had not replaced magia, but that they were simultaneously existing dual sides of the nebulous coin of magic. Lewis seemed to see the interaction of science, religion, and magic, not as a triangle, not as three points, but as a square, 
four points working together. This diagram is also courtesy of Tom Shippey with Rainbowfication by myself. You may note that the term science in this diagram has been replaced with scientism. This is a really important distinction. Science itself, the practice of investigating and testing natural phenomena in order to expand the human understanding of the world is not what Lewis was trying to examine here. Rather, he wants to discuss scientism, which instead of being just the pursuit of science, is a belief that science is the only way that humans can come to expand their understanding of the universe. In this diagram, we also see a separation of Magia and Goetia. They are both, by Lewis's admission, metaphorical not considered real in the same way that religion or science are, but better to be used as metaphorical devices in literature and art, a tool for explaining other concepts. This is in opposition to religion and scientism, which are both considered very real and literal acting forces in the modern day. On the other side of the square, religion and magia are both seen as genial, as having some sort of a positive impact on the world. Whereas scientism and Goetia are both mechanical, they are both being used as tools by humankind to enact on the world. This isn't a perfect look at all of the ways that Lewis has used magic throughout his works, but I think it allows us a somewhat more comprehensive and integrated look at the ways that these sort of things function and honestly work together even today. It also shows how important this magia was to the Inklings and to the burgeoning fantasy genre. Magia, exemplified by its treatment in the medieval era, has a sort of purity and innocence that Goetia simply does not. Nowadays, the Inklings figured, religion expressly forbade magic and the occult. There is now established a black and white, a strict line of good and evil, and magic and sorcery fall on the evil side. However, the inevitable, widely accepted magic that they saw in the medieval era, which didn't seem to be terribly at odds with the religious beliefs of the time, introduced a grey to that black and white binary. Magia allowed for something that Goetia did not an innocent magician. Science and Goetia both seem so concerned with exerting human will over the natural world, but Magia was an admission that there were higher powers, that the universe was thrumming with an energy of its own, an energy that human beings would never fully dominate. This type of magic fit in much better with the Inkling's worldview, and it had a strong influence on how Tolkien treated magic in his world. Tolkien, however, does deviate from Lewis's perspective. Whereas for Lewis, magia was generally good and Goetia was generally overall bad, Tolkien did not see it so simply. He explains, neither is, in this tale, good or bad per se, but only by motive or purpose or use. Both sides use both, but with different motives. For Tolkien, magia can be summed up as immediacy, speed, reduction of labor, and reduction also to a minimum or vanishing point of the gap between the idea or desire and the result or effect. In the hands of the elves, this manifests itself as a freeing from human limitations, like eating, sleeping, or death. They create flawless art, impossibly beautiful music, sublime sub-creations that reflect the greater Middle-earth created by their god. Magicians like Tom Bombadil are able to harness the raw power of the universe, using it not to harm, but to help. In the hands of evil, however, Magia behaves quite differently. Rather than using Magia for good purposes, Morgoth, Sauron, and all evil creatures use it for their own will. And it manifests in machines and slavery, allowing ideas to go from conception to realization very quickly on the backs of those that they've subjugated. Goetia, in Tolkien's vision, is a sort of smoke and mirrors a wisdom that allows you to get yourself into the psychology of others. In the hands of the just, it can be used to soothe, to comfort, to protect. Tolkien calls the use of Goetia in the hands of the good entirely 
artistic. However, when used for evil, Goetia can manipulate and hurt, it terrifies and it subjugates. When explaining the nature of her magical mirror to Frodo and Sam, Galadriel says that it is what your folk would call magic, I believe, though I do not understand clearly what they mean, and they seem to use the same word for the deceits of the enemy. But this is, if you will, the magic of Galadriel. Magic, whatever it is, the real tangible impact of magia or the smoke and mirrors of Galatia, seems to be more of a neutral tool, something that changes depending on who's using it. Even then, in Middle-earth, magic seems very easy to turn to evil. Even the mirror of Galadriel, the magic of Galadriel, the elven queen, it's not entirely beneficial. Remember that the mirror shows many things, and not all have yet come to pass. Some have never come to be, unless those that behold the visions turn aside from their paths to prevent them. The mirror is dangerous as a guide of deeds. This is a warning that echoes through a lot of fiction, especially Frank Herbert's Dune books. Dune heavily explores this idea of prescience, and what would happen to the human mind if it was given the ability to see the future. What seems like it could be a superpower is revealed to be a curse, as those who now understand the correct path for humankind have to try to steer humankind to that path. The reality is that magic, sci-fi drugs, and future predicting mirrors are not a typical part of the human experience. At least not my human experience, I don't know what you get up to. Even magia, as genial as it is, is unpredictable, wild, and unnatural. The danger of magic, especially Galatian magic, is fully explored in the character of Saruman. He is the most magically powerful of all of the wizards, but it is his knowledge, his thirst for more and more magic that turns him towards evil. It had been his job to keep an eye on Sauron, to know him, to study him, and it seems that Saruman may have done that job a little bit too well because the foul Goetia of Sauron infects him too. But Saruman was certainly set up to be susceptible to this. Saruman had always desired leadership, taking over the White Council, even though Galadriel would have preferred Gandalf take the role. This desire to control, to rule, is a trait found in a lot of Middle-earth's most wanted, including Sauron. Sauron and Saruman both felt that their wisdom was superior, that the rest of the world would be happier if it was under their tyranny. And in the end, it was this inclination to possess, to control, that drew Saruman to the dark side. Unlike Gandalf and Radagast, who used their connection to magic to help to comfort, to guide the nature and peoples of Middle-earth, Saruman wanted to use his powers to usurp, to control. He tells Gandalf that we must have power, power to order all things as we will, for that good which only the wise can see. His closeness to magic, and most importantly, his use of it for selfish purpose, corrupts Saruman. It withers him. This is a beautiful reflection of the most well-known wizard of the Middle Ages, Merlin. In the Tales of King Arthur, they say that Merlin's use of magic has withered him. They describe him using the word seer. Just by using magic, even for just purposes, Merlin is whittled away, becoming, just like Saruman, a seer man. Tolkien was very careful with his name, so the similarity between Saruman and Merlin's seer man is no accident. Through Saruman, we see the way that magic can turn into poison if it is not used with the utmost care and righteousness. As a distinctly and inherently unnatural power, it can be too overwhelming, even for an eternal being like a wizard. But that's not to say that all magic is inherently evil in Tolkien's world. In fact, a sort of magic lies at the very heart of Middle-earth in what he calls fairy. Just as the elves were able to use magia to subcreate, to make art that was reflective of the larger creative vision of Middle-earth, Tolkien thought each of us capable of using sub-creative magic. He believed that with words, art, and music, we could reflect back the beauty of creation around us, and Tolkien used his magia 
to subcreate entire dense worlds within this reality. Art that captured this subcreative power was referred to by Tolkien as fairy, a word he found very difficult to define. Fairy cannot be caught in a net of words, for it is one of its qualities to be indescribable though not imperceptible. Fairy itself may perhaps most nearly be translated by magic, but it is a magic of peculiar mood and power at the furthest pole from the vulgar devices of the laborious scientific magician. Tolkien's fairy seems to be the epitome of good magic used for good. Fairy does not seek to change the real world, but rather to explore it to come to a deeper understanding and appreciation of it. Tolkien believed that through the art of fairy, through the magic of fantasy, we can survey the depths of space and time and hold communion with other living things. For Tolkien, magic isn't a tool or an ability or a system. It is a rhythm of the universe, a power that beats at the heart of all of our imaginations. It allows mankind to see past the dreary every day and into the heart of much greater, much more important truths. And I think the most beautiful part about Tolkien's magic is that it can be true. We experience Tolkien's powerful magia, his artful goetia, his beautiful, beautiful magic. Every time we enter one of his subcreated fairy worlds. Speaking of magical, please allow me the pleasure of introducing you to this video's sponsor, Squarespace, the practically magical all-in-one website platform that allows you to stand out and succeed online. Squarespace has taken the scary part out of making your own custom website. Through your Squarespace site, you can stay connected with your audience in brand new ways, including using their blogging tool, where you can share your stories, your videos, and your images directly with your audience. You can even run your own email campaign right from your site. Squarespace will gather email addresses for you, making it super easy to keep your audience up to date. With Squarespace's intuitive analytics software, you can track things like site visits and sales to highlight your most effective areas. They also provide insights into your top keywords, products, content, anything you need to grow your business to the next level. Squarespace makes creating your own website and establishing your online presence incredibly simple. So whether you're just starting out or you want to take your brand to the next level, go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Jess of the Shire to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video, and thank you to all of you for checking out my sponsors when I have them. I am going to do a full video on magic systems outside of the Lord of the Rings, so let me know what your favorite magic system is from books, movie, or television so that I can cover them in that video. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and give it a like because that really helps me out, and please consider subscribing if you want to get a video from me every single week. Special shout out to my Patreon Discord for this video because they helped me pick this video topic out, and if you want to be one of the people that helps pick out my video topics every once in a while, go ahead and check out my Patreon, which is linked in the description. Thank you so much for joining me this week, and I hope that you have a very happy hobbity day.